Sounds difficult, but it's actually pretty easy today. Um, so we already got done talking. We said, hey, we can write um, some uh, linear models for anything that would show a positive or a negative correlation to look linear. So what we want to do today is this. We want to look at some of the vocab that comes with it. The vocab looks difficult. I think if we work through the examples, you really understand what it is that that stuff means as we run through it. So as we're reading the vocab, if it doesn't make sense right away, that's fine. We'll talk about what it means when we start looking at the examples. So uh, today we want to ask ourselves is how can we analytically find a line of best fit for a scatter plot? We know what scatter plots are now, right? And we know what a fitted line to a correlating positively or negatively uh, graph looks like. So we can fit lines there. And you guys in the last section were already writing equations for the best line of fit. So today, um, a lot of words, but Computer's going to do a lot of the work for you today, which is kind of nice. All right. So goals to answer that question right now, we're going to have to use what we call residuals to determine how well lines of fit model data. We're going to use the technology to find some lines of best fit, and then we're going to distinguish between what's called correlation and causation. Some big words here. All right. First term I want you to read here: residual. How about a volunteer to read that for me? All right, Carson. The difference of the y value and the Corresponding line value found in the line of fit. Okay, we'll show you what that means here in the table. Do you guys see the table right down here? We're talking about snowfall and, and in pairs of gloves sold as it relates to the number of inches of snowfall. Do they give you a y value right here? They do. We're going to find a y value from the model that they give up here, and we're going to be looking at the difference. How close is that model to the actual number? Okay? So, residual, you might just want to write down as uh, it's just. Uh, uh, it's a difference. It's a difference from what you actually have from what you, to what you think you should get. It's a difference from your prediction to what you should really get. So maybe I should write this down. I write down it's really the actual value minus your um, estimate. Actual value minus your estimate is what it says. Okay. We'll talk about residuals here in a second, uh, but you want residual values to be low. You want them to be around zero. Okay? So right here, I'm going to maybe put residual. You want values kind of close to zero when you do that. And I'll talk to you about what that means here. Somewhere close to zero. And, and I think when we look at the first two examples, that would make total sense to be okay, Karen. All right, linear regression. Linear regression is basically going to be the method that we use in the graphing calculator to find a precise line of fit that models a set of data. Basically, we're going to use the computer to come up with our formula for the line of fit in this form. Y equals mx plus g form. All right? You're not going to have to find that anymore. The computer's going to do it for you. Unless you want to. I can say, hey, choose two points. Find the slope. Two point slope form. Get down the slope intercept form. You don't want to do that anymore? You sure? Yeah. Aww. Cool. All right, line of best fit. You guys know what a, a line of best fit is. You already did that scatter plot yesterday, right? Putting that line in the scatter plot. Yeah. How do you know? I didn't show off. Yeah. Yeah. If it trends, if it, if it trends, you continue to move to the right and the points appear to keep moving up. So, like, if it was like coming on the left, coming on the right, that would like kind of show that same thing. Depends. Depends on your own opinion here. It can be opinion at different times. Correlation coefficient. This is going to be a biggie. All right. This is going to be a biggie. Um, this is going to be something that we discuss on page 139, or I'm sorry, that 193 that you had. So you might want to write down that we're even referring to page 193 when we talk about that. Um, I'm not going to tell you how they get that. We don't need to know how they come up with the R value right away, but the R value tells you how good a model is for a set of data. Tells you if that line is really accurate or if it's pretty far off uh, of your information. Okay? Two terms that we're going to use interpolation and extrapolation. Think of this 
You have a point over here on the left. You have a point over here on the right. Everybody looking at me? If yeah, I want to make a prediction, if I want to make a prediction between these two points or inside of these two points, that's called interpolation. You're on the inside of the point. So if I want to make a prediction about values that say outside these two points, extrapolation. I think interior, exterior, when I see that, okay? So think of, okay, I have two points here. If I want to make a prediction on the outside of the points, it's extrapolation. If I want to make a prediction on the inside of the points, it's interpolation. A little sour silver? <laughs> I love it. It's just even looking at your face. All right, so interpolation, you might want to highlight or underline um, approximating values between two known values. And for extrapolation, you might want to write down predicting values outside the range of values. Okay. And again, we'll look at examples that talk about these terms here in a bit. And then the last one that we have there is causation. Causation is when a change in one variable causes a change to another variable. Okay. So as an example... If the amount of money I make is a function of the time I work, the question becomes, what's the effect? Well, if I change the number of hours I work, in other words, I work more and more hours, then what's the effect of the amount of money I make? You get more. So the cause is change the number of hours. The effect on that is to make more money. Okay. So you're going to hear an awful lot about that. We kind of talked about that yesterday. What's the trend here? Is it a positive trend, negative trend? If it was a positive trend, we said if x gets larger, your y value is going to get larger. So you're kind of talking about trends when you're dealing with that. Okay, here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to head up to the computer here and, and be putting some values in. I'm going to kind of go split screen with this a little bit. I learned how to do that today. I'm kind of excited about it. I've never known how to do it. Does that make me a rookie? Okay. So I'm going to hit the windows and write for this one, right, guys? Whoa, look at that. It's exciting. Open this up and go Windows left. Whoa, look at that. All right, here we go. Uh, what I want you guys to do is this. I want you to jump into your Desmos calculator first. Okay. And actually, I'd like to switch these around. How can I switch these around, guys? There we go. That's what I want right there. Okay. Now, is there a way to change the... Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, kiddos. Here's what we're going to do today. I want someone to read example one for me right here in your notes. This table shows the number y of blubs sold for each amount x in inches of snowfall. The equation y equals 1.5x plus 3.5 models the data if, if the model a good fit. Okay. What I want someone to do for me here is this. All these points that are here, and this table actually runs over into the second page, runs into the second page up top here. What I want you guys to do first is this. I want you guys to tell me what the points are. So I'm going to go into decimals. Basically, what this is saying is when you had three inches of snow right here, how many pairs of gloves are sold? When I have six inches of snow in this particular store, how many pairs of gloves were sold? Twelve. Okay, what I want to be able to do, and you can graph that stuff in decimals as I'm doing, but what I'd like someone to do is to read me that chart. It starts on the first page. starts on the first page bottom. So the first point is really one comma what, guys? All right, so let me put these points in. So I'm going to throw a table together here. Okay, first one, one, five. All right, my next one, two, eight. Next point, three, seven, four, ten, five, eleven, six, twelve. That's about how tall I am. Okay, that wasn't fun. Seven, fourteen. Is there an eighth one? That's it? Okay. Let's take a look at these points here quickly, gang. Uh, let me zoom out a bit so we can see most of these points. Okay, so guys, uh, looking at that points, looking at all the points right there, first question is this. Does that appear to show some kind of a trend or a correlation? I'd say positive correlation. 
as my x values get larger, or in this case, as the snow gets deeper, what happens to the sales for pairs of gloves? They increase, right? They increase. Okay, so we understand what the plot looks like. We understand what the trend looks like. If you were to draw a fitted line in here, do you guys think the fitted line might be kind of like, oh, maybe between these two points and through here somehow? You guys agree with that? Would a fitted line be good if it was clear out here where my cursor is? No? Would it be good up here above all the points? So go back to your example that they're talking about right here. They want to know the following. Is this function right here, y, equal 1.5x plus 3.5, does that data model... Does that model represent the data well? Well, I don't know. I don't know. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go back to my graph, and I'm going to type that in. What was the function they were talking about again? Y equals what? There's where the line lands, right there. Okay. Do you think that that's a pretty good fitted line for that data? It is. It's very good, isn't it? It fits that data really well. You can see that visually. And that's kind of what we did yesterday. Okay. So what we want to look at doing today is talking about these terms residuals and correlation factors or correlation coefficients, if you will. And I'll show you what that is in a second. But we want to look at charts and not even have to graph this to know if that line of fit is good or not. So let me show you how this is done. You guys are cool with the graph part, right? And we're going to say, is this a good model for that data? You're going to say yes, because that line fits that data very well right there. You can see that visually. All right. Well, let's look how this um, um, is discussed when we're talking about residuals. Here's how this works when we start talking about residuals. The first thing that we have is this. Nice thing was, we didn't have to come up with an equation for a line. Kind of did. They gave that to us. They wanted to say, hey, does this model that data well enough or not? So here's how this is going to work for us today. What I'm going to do is this. We know what our x values were, right? And we know what the actual pairs of gloves were sold for each inch of snow that we had. So they went through and got that data. But here's how this works. We're going to get some new y values from the model. In other words, we're going to take our x values and input them up here to get a new y value. All right? So for the first one right here, for the first one right here, we're basically going to substitute one in for what? So let's do that. Let's go 1.5 times what first? Which is the first one. 1.5 times 1 is 1.5 plus 3.5. That turns out to be a value of 5. So let's get these values in here. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. Let's go ahead and call this value of 5 right there. Okay. That comes from substituting 1 in there. You understand how I did that? All I did is took this x value of 1 and plugged it into the model. So when I input 1, your output is 5. Okay, so the next input I'm going to have is what? 2. Help me out here. 2 times 1.5 is 3, isn't it? 3 plus 3.5 would be? Okay, now quick question, you guys. On that first point, how many pairs of gloves actually sold with 1 inch of snow, according to the table? One inch of snow, five work. What did the model tell us we would get if we input one? Five. How do those values relate? How do those two values relate? Five and five, how do they relate? Same. They're the same. They're the same. That's good, isn't it? Okay, residual is found by taking this actual value right here minus this model value. So if I go five minus five right here, I get a zero. When your residual values are close to zero, that means your model is pretty much right on with the actual information that's given in the chart. Okay. Now for two inches of snowfall, how many pairs of gloves did you definitely sell? Eight. The linear model says you should sell about how many? 6.5. So what's the residual difference there? Eight minus 6.5 would be, well, 1.5. Okay. Is that residual rate at zero? In other words, did the exact amount of gloves sold in the model agree completely? No, but were they pretty darn close? Yeah, they were. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Finish this table. 
interest table. Let's see, what was the function again? Y equaled? 1.5 x plus 3.5. 1.5 x plus 3.5. I need a volunteer who would be willing to substitute 3 in for me. Who wants to substitute 3 in and get my new Y value? Okay, Miriam's got it. Someone for 4. I'll do it. Maddie, 5. Who will do 5 for me? Plug in 5. Volunteer to plug in 5. Who? Sharon? Volunteer for 6. 6 and then 7. Who put in 7 for me? Put in 7 for X. Okay, go ahead. When you've got your value, just raise your hand and shoot your uh, X value. We'll get a, a model Y value here. Okay, you were three, right, Mary? Okay, so seven times 1.5 was 10 point, no, three. You said eight, kiddo? Okay, who had four? Me. Got it? 9.5. 9.5, who was my five? You. Okay, 11. Uh, how much? 12.5, and who was the last one? 14. Okay, so let's look at our residuals right here. Again, we set up a residual from the actual amount of love sold to this compared to the model amount. We're basically inputting the number of inches of snow in for X. If that residual is pretty close to zero, we're pretty much in the park with stuff. So help me out. 7 minus 8 up here. Negative, negative 1. So this residual is negative 1. Is that pretty close to zero? Yeah. You bet. We're in the park. Mm -hmm. Next one. 10 minus 9 and a half. What is that? 0.5, right? How about the next one? 11 minus 11? Zero. zero. When residual is at zero, that's good, isn't it? You understand what residual is now, guys? Mm -hmm. How about 12 minus 12.5? Negative 0.5. Good. Finally, 14 minus 14? Zero. Now, the thing I like to do, and you don't necessarily have to do this, but guys, when those residuals are low, really close to zero like that, that means that my model, or the equation of that line, y equals 1.5x plus 3.5, that line is a very good model for all the data. That just means that the data is very close to that fitted line. Okay. Now, one thing I like to do is do what I call, and you might want to write this down, total residual. Total residual. Okay. Wait. Yeah. You took that. The actual value that we had. So okay. these were the actual values that they went in and said, hey, how many did you sell when you had three inches of snow? Okay. Minus what the model values got us when we input those X values. So it's the actual minus the model value to get you your. Residual value. Karen, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. I like to go back to do this and, and, and look at the total residual right here. Again, the total residual is close to what value? Zero. We're in good shape. Go back to this first page. Let's start working this. Let's add these up. What's zero? Our first residual is zero plus 1.5. We're at 1.5 total. And then go back to this page. 1.5. Oops, minus 1 now. Where are you at now? 0.5 plus 0.5, 1 plus 0, 1 still minus the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 plus the 0. So I total all the residuals up, we end up with all of them put together being 0.5, all together, 0.5. Okay. Very close to 0, right? Okay, so when that residual is close to 0, that line of fit is a great approximation for the data. Yes, sir? So if the residual, like, let's say, we were to do a line that also has to go like, uh, six to the minus, right? Mm -hmm. Wait, not to the minus, but uh, it's kind of, it, it, listen, I would probably say it's a good line of fit. I'd say, I'd say if your total residual, because you should have points above and below the line. And the ones that are above the line should cancel out the ones that are below the line. You know, there's no real magic number that says, hey, you should be this far off or that far off for a good line of fit. But um, I would say if you're within five positively or negatively, 
I see you're in pretty good shape for that total residual. So if you're from negative five to positive five on total residual, I'd say that's probably a pretty good estimate. Right? Probably a pretty good estimate. Okay. Okay, well, let's look at another one here. Let's look at this one how this time without graphing it. See if we can come up with a prediction as to whether or not this model is good for the given data as we relate it to residuals, and then we'll, we'll see where we're at. So here's the deal. Example two says the table shows high temperatures on Monday for eight straight weeks. I have to put week eight in here. You're going to want to do the same thing. So week eight, the value I want to put in here is 76. It says the equation we want to model this data with is the following. Y equals 7x minus 8. So the high temperatures on Monday equal the number of weeks times 7 minus 8. Is this a good model? All right. Well, uh, oops, I forgot to do something here quickly, guys. We need to change this here. Change this to Monday. Change this to temp right here, okay? All right, so the first Monday, what was the temperature, guys? 40. First Monday that we measured, 48. Okay, we want to know, does the model 7x minus 8 fit this well? So what I need are eight volunteers. I need eight volunteers to go ahead and put these values in for x, input x to get me an output y for this model. Who will put in one for me? Sharon's got one, who's got two? Maddie. Maddie. Three, Miriam three, John four, uh, Nathan five, somebody for six for me please. Six, Gavin seven, seven, Hunter you got seven, Carson you do eight. So we're going to input these values for x, subtract eight, tell me what the model temperature would be. Six, what'd you get? Thirty-four degrees. Okay, so six is thirty-four. Okay, Maddie, what number were you? Yeah. Okay. Who is my one? Sarah, have you got it? Uh, what's seven times one? Seven minus eight. Right? Okay, who had two? I did six. Six, who had three? Thirteen. I agree. Who had four? Who plugged in four? Twenty. Twenty, who had five for me? 27. 27. We've got 34 at 6. Who had 7? Yep. 41. What was the last one? 48. 48. All right. So let's check out these residuals. Again, we want to total up the residuals. We want to say that eh, plus or minus 5 is probably pretty decent. Is that a 6? Where? The second one? No. Uh, the fifth one. 27. Okay, let's look at our residuals. 48 minus negative 1, kiddos. What's the residual? Add 1, right? Minus a negative. It would be 49. Oh, boy. That model's off by how many degrees on that first one? 49 degrees. Is this starting out well or not? No. Okay, 43 minus 6. How far off? 37, right? 42 minus 13 is 29. How about the 40 minus 20 in the next row? 20. Good oh boy. What are we going to do with these residuals in the end? Add them all up. Are we getting anywhere close to zero? No. I'll finish the table for you here quickly. This turns out to be 18. This turns out to be uh, 22. Holy smoke. Uh, 67 and 41 is 26. Let me do a difference. 76 minus 48 is 28. 
is the line y equals seven x minus eight a good line of fit for the data? No. No. And your reason because our total residuals nowhere close to what? Nowhere close to zero. Okay? Not even close. So without even graphing this, I'm not even going to graph this, but if I had all the dots plotted, would that line even be close to the dots or kind of far off the dots? Yeah. Pretty far off. And yeah. So you add up the yep, add them up. And I think that this is like 200, and I can't remember. I did it earlier today. Want to do it 229. Quick? 229. Yeah. So is that close to zero? No. When we're talking about being maybe five above or five below. We're not even close, are we? Not even close. So Carson, mm -hmm. what would you consider close to zero? I would say a five above or five below. Okay. Okay. But these problems are going to be set up nicely. It's a you'll know. You'll know. Will will we find any of these on big ideas? Yeah. All right. So here's the part I think is really cool. Um, example three. This is pretty sweet. Using technology for linear regression. Okay. In the past or in the last session, I said, hey, you guys come up with the equation for the y. All right. And that's kind of time consuming, isn't it? You got to find your point. Then you got to find your slope. Then you got to plug a point in. Then you've got to manipulate the equation so you get back to slope intercept form. Then you've got to use your equation in slope intercept form to answer questions. Make predictions. Well, today, the thing that I really like about using technology for this is the following. We could come up with our own equation, but there are fancy programs out there, and I'm not going to show you how they come up with all this stuff formulaized. That's something you'll get in a stats class someday. But that one calculator that you have called linear regression, Go to it right now. All right, I just love this. It says the table below shows the number X of teachers. So here's some teachers in a building and a number Y of students in several schools. So for instance, in this first school, how many teachers are there? Ten students for how many? I'm sorry, ten teachers for how many students? Two fifty. Two fifty. So let me write this off this way. You get into the linear regression calculator. This one. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to put this information right here in like so. Now, when it says enter the x, y values, just enter the numbers only. So the first point I'm really putting in is 10 comma what? 10 comma 250. So 10 comma 250. Hit return. Okay. What's the next point I'm going to put in? Well, 12 comma 275. Next point. 13 comma 312 what's after 13 312 next point and then the last one 18 comma 406 okay now go ahead down here do you see where it says submit data go ahead and hit submit on that thing all right go ahead and hit submit on that and then go ahead and form a graph for you it's a nice plot okay nice plot right there looks like that plot shows what kind of correlation shows a positive correlation you guys see this part right up top here where it said y equals this mess right up here? Everybody see that? Okay. Why don't you go to your third page of your notes. We put all this data in. The data has been plotted. They put a fitted line in here for you. This fitted line is defined by this equation right up here. Whoa, that was cool. I took a picture. See that equation right up there? Yeah. Okay, now they kind of write it in a goofy form. We like to put our slope first. Now, in first hour, I told first hour to go a couple decimal places. However, I think your assignment's going to ask you to round stuff to the nearest full number. But guys, right here, I have y equals, do you see the 20.64 blah, blah, blah times x right here? Okay. So let's just talk about this right here. I could really say 20.64 is my slope. 
What I'm going to have you do is round that slope up to the nearest whole number. So 20.64 would round to what for the nearest whole number? 21. Okay, 21. You have 21x. 5 plus 21x. And then 42.33 repeating. What's the nearest whole number for that? 42 or 43? Plus 42. Okay. This program right here took all your points and it gave you a line of best fit. Now, more accurately, you could use these values right here to get that. That's cool if you want to do that. We're going to round stuff to the nearest whole number for our purposes, okay? So over here, when they say uh, the following up top here in your notes, whoops, I need to undo this. Okay, so up top here, when they say, hey, use a computer to find the line of best fit, What's your equation going to be? 21x plus how much? 20.64 is closer to 21 than it is 20. Okay with that? We're going to round to the nearest whole number. Okay? Mm -hmm. Alright with that? So you're just looking at this regression line. Please. <laughs> kind of, it's written backwards a little bit, which is kind of funny, but as long as you know x is right here, you've got 21x plus 42, okay? All right, now the next part says identify the r value, right? This is where I want you to look at. Uh, I want to read through you. Now, this r value is basically what they call a correlation coefficient. Do not, do not, I repeat, do not confuse this with what we were doing with the residuals. This is the part right here on this page where, let me maximize this. If you're on that page 193 right here, guys, I'm going to read this paragraph here quickly. It says, graphing calculators use a method called linear regression. That's what we just did with that program. Okay, that put that line in there and gave you an equation. And you're going to find a precise line of fit like we did called that line of best fit. It says, this line best models a set of data. The calculator often gives a value R called the, here it is highlighted, correlation coefficient. This value tells whether the correlation is positive or negative, first of all. What was the slope in that problem, guys? 21. Is that a positive slope or a negative slope? So we're going to have a positive R value, okay? And how closely the equation models the data. It says values of R range from negative 1 to positive 1. It says when R is close to 1 or to negative 1, there is a strong correlation between the variables. As R gets closer to 0, the correlation becomes weaker. Now residuals being close to 0 is good. But when we start talking about R values, getting close to 0 is bad. So right here, this chart kind of really explains what's going on. If your R value is negative 1 or close to it, what kind of correlation do you have? Strong negative. It means the line is decreasing and all the points are really close to your line of fit. If you get to 0, what's this implying? No correlation. And if you get to positive 1, this is implying a strong positive correlation. You know that first example we did with the snowfall and the gloves? Was that line really close to all the points? On that one that we graphed that first example, it was, wasn't it? That was a strong positive correlation. So here's the dealio. How do you find this R value? Well, go back into your, your calculator. Whoops. Go back into your calculator. All right. Hey, you guys have this right here, right? You see this link down here? It says correlation coefficient right here. Go ahead and click that now. That's your R value. Correlation coefficient. Which variable? What value do they give you? We'll go two places. 0.96, right? When I round? 0.96. Okay, you see how I got that? You click that link. You click that link. Okay, so again, how did I get there? Oh, where'd my data go? There's my data. Below my data, you see this link for correlation coefficient? That's how you get it. So click that. And what's our R value here, kiddos? 0.96. So 0.96, identify the R value. R is 0.96. R is 
So if I look back on my page or my chart that I had for the um, Big Ideas Math on page 193, let's see, R.96.96 would be way over here by 1. So what are you going to say about your correlation, guys? Strong positive. What would like a 0.5 be here in the middle? Instead of strong positive, probably a weak. Yeah, opposite of strong is weak, right? So I would say anything about 0.5 here would be a weak positive. You okay with that? Okay. So what am I going to say here? Well, I'm simply going to say. So R is positive and strong positive. Yeah, no, it, it can be negative one. This is just saying it's strong positive because the graph is increasing. If this was a negative 21 x right here, kiddo, slope would be negative. If you were close to negative 1, that would just mean either you're really strong, it's just that you're decreasing this time. Instead of increasing like our line was like this, negative means your line was decreasing. Okay? So when you're out here at negative 1 or positive 1, very strong. The more you get to the 0 in the middle for your R value, then it's really weak or no correlation. Okay? What's that? Oh, yeah. And you'll get that answer. You'll get that answer basically from plugging it in here. Okay? All right. So then the next thing we need to do, guys, is interpret our slope and our y-intercept in this problem. So let's do this quickly. Interpret the slope and interpret the y-intercept. Well, what is the slope, guys? In that equation that we wrote right up top, part A, for linear regression, what, what do we have for our slope? Somebody said it. I just didn't catch it. Slope of what value? 21. Okay. Well, guys, all this means in this is the following. We have some teachers and we have some students. Okay. How many kids are in this class right now? About 20, 21 of you. The guy up here is leading the class right now. What this really implies is this. If our school would add about 21 more kids, what do you think our school would probably have to do? Add another teacher. That's what that slope is implying. For every increase, uh, in students of a value 21, so for every for every 21 students, ah, for every 21 students, added. Should do what? If I add 21 students to the school, what should we do? Add another teacher. So for every 21 students added, you should add another teacher. So that's what that means in the context of this problem. What does that 21 mean? Well, we add 21 students to our school, add another teacher. Okay. Now I love the next question. What's the y-intercept and what's it represent? What's the y-intercept and what's it represent? First of all, what was the y-intercept between this value? That y-intercept would be 42. Now think of this, guys. A y-intercept in the first quadrant. This is your number of teachers here. This is your number of students. Y-intercept here would be up here at 42. The graph kind of goes like that. Guys, if the y intercept is 42, how many teachers does this correspond to down here? Zero. Okay, so now let's think about that. Are you going to have a school of 42 students and zero teachers? Mm. You guys would probably like that, wouldn't you? Yes. Going to school with zero teachers? Yeah. Wait, yeah. you don't want me here? Uh, we need more yeah, days. Days and I buy you pizza. pizza. Okay, well, we can make that work. But guys, is that 42 really relevant in this situation? I, I understand it's a value for the model, but is it really telling you that, hey, if you had 42 students in a school, there would be zero teachers? Is that going to be true or false? Uh, be false. That, that y intercept of 42 really has no meaning in the context of the problem. It's just there to help you with the model. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop there. That's as far as we'll get. We'll pick this up on uh, Monday, but uh, you guys enjoy your weekend.